Hey everybody, I've got Robin Hanson here. We're going to be discussing the Turing test and the recent passing of it by the teen bot Eugene Goostman. Um, and related and topics. And related sure. topics. <laughs> Hopefully. That'll be good. <laughs> Over to you, Robin. So what do you think about all this? Uh, well, it's unfortunately necessary to uh, highlight um, these you know, relatively minor milestones in order to keep bringing fundamental issues back to the public, I guess. But you know, fundamentally, uh, machine progress has been relatively slow and steady over a very long time. And when we pass a milestone like this, it doesn't at all indicate that there's any sudden burst ahead or any rapid changes uh, being foretold. Uh, you should still expect slow and steady progress at the same rate we've seen it for the last half century. Slow and steady. I reckon it's fast. I reckon it. I, well, I reckon we're on the on, on the margin. On a cosmological the... time scale, of course, it's quite fast. <laughs> but uh, I, well, let's just say uh, whatever the rate has been over the last half century, uh, there's no particular reason to think anything dramatic has changed here. Uh, this is just passing a uh, milestone. It's certainly yeah. It is a it is a milestone, but other people would say it's not really a stone. It's really a line in the sand, or mild or mild pebble, perhaps. I mean, it depends <laughs> on how big a deal you think this is. <laughs> well, I tend to think it's not that big a deal. I guess the the degree of dealness comes down to what people believe uh, the Turing test means. Um, I think the modern you know, most people believe that the Turing test is meant to sort of signify um, that AI has grown up and is now ready to sort of join society um, and become voting citizens. Maybe not so much, but you know what I mean? Like there's the public perception of um, like a, of the Turing test and, uh, you know, just general tests to test the intelligence so-called of AIs and then there's what's really going on. I'm much more impressed by passing milestones that represent real substantial value being achieved. So a self-driving car, that's an important milestone. Uh, face recognition software, that's a real milestone because it has real applications. Uh, Watson even, uh, I mean, that, that has yet to reveal substantial you know, economic value, but at least uh, it looks like it has a potential in that direction. Um, but if, if, you know, we can endlessly multiply various artificial, you know, milestones and definitions and argue about whether any one thing has passed some official definition, but if it isn't connected to some concrete way that we use these things, I'm not sure how much it matters. So you, you don't think that there's a 13-year-old AI um, listening to all our chat and uh, reveling in its fame? And, uh, I mean, the, the, ob the obvious application here is that people will write chat bots to go participate in chat forums, etc., in order to attract people to their advertising or, what, you know, to sell them coupons or things like that. So I expect that as chat bots get better, it will just be harder and harder to participate in forums where uh, there's very low bandwidth about people, which makes it easier to mimic them. The, the longer-term trend here, I think, is going to be that uh, people will prefer interactions where they have stronger signals that who the, whoever they're interacting with is not an automated bot right. uh, because people will just not want to do that and they'll want to sort it out so you know pure text interaction may uh, become less popular yeah. Uh, yeah 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 so it seems it's interesting um, the, the, putatively there's not all that much complexity underneath the Eugene Goodman 13 year old English as a second language bot and um, it, it's quite possible that like the, the designers were really trying to fool the judges rather than prove uh, a point about intelligence. Um, so, yeah, I, like I think it's interesting that um, at the moment there are a lot of like uh, text bots out there trying to vie for our attention. I'm worried that this could be a signal to for for those sorts of companies that deploy all these tech spots to uh, ramp up the volume, so to speak. So we we're keeping we, we're just keeping getting slapped in the face with like a chat bot. So are we are we approaching a chat? I, chat I think they already have a pretty strong signal. This isn't adding much to it. Well, 
There's, I hope not. there's already lots of bots out there trying to add comments to blogs. I have to deal with lots of that, adding comments to all sorts of online forums, adding you know comments to chat rooms, etc. Mm-hmm. So I think basically everybody will just have to raise their standards. Of course, you know it's an arms race. We'll create also bots to detect bots. Do you, and, I mean uh, fan filters? Or? Or, or, I do, or more active bots that if you're interacting with somebody, not only might it be a bot on the other end, but you'll have your own bot trying to check to see whether you're interacting with a bot. Right. Okay. And, the more, and the wider the bandwidth, the more that will be possible. Sure. So, you know, so you imagine if it's not chat that there's a video and then some bot is constructing a video, but now your bot has all this video feed to work with to try to tell if it's a fake or a real person on the other end. Well, and let's talk, uh, let's, so, okay, well, I, I, uh, you don't see a future in which um, the last human wimpers will sort of drown in the sea of chatbots in the near future. No, no, not not even in the far future. I mean, it, it just means you have to amp up your detection ability, right? But humans have long been playing this game of deception and, and detection of deception. So we, we've developed sophisticated, complicated tools to try to look for deception. And the more that we have automated assistance for detection, the more we want to have automated assistance to detect deception. And those will just go together. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it doesn't look like, you know, the ability to notice deception is going to be a problem substantially as long as we try. Mm -hmm. It's the same way for, like, crime and and, uh, locks. So basically, um, you know, in my neighborhood, there's not much crime, and the locks and the doors are really cheap. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean what we're protecting is really cheap. It means that cheap locks are good enough. Uh, should there be a spate of, you know, burglaries uh, that go through our cheap locks, we'd all replace our cheap locks with more expensive locks. But it would still be a small fraction of our budget. But we we stick with the cheap locks because we can get away with it. In the same way for most of us, don't even bother to try very hard to detect whether we're interacting with as a bot because it's very implausible usually that that would happen. But the more it starts happening, <laughs> the more we'll amp up our detection. And try harder to make sure it doesn't happen. Yeah, well, remind me not to broadcast where you live then. <laughs> Just in case there's I'm... any potential thieves listening in. <laughs> so, not too worried. <laughs> so, um, look, it, it seems like it's a useful endeavor to design more uh, sophisticated uh, Turing tests, for want of a better name, if you want to call it that. Um, yeah, what? Can you give me some examples of uh, Turing tests you think will be more relevant in the future or will be more useful? I mean, it's, it's in a sense kind of silly. that uh, What I think is interesting is that machines are getting better and they will be able to take on more, slowly more roles in society. So uh, eventually you'll have a machine that was so capable that it can take on a wide range of roles of the sorts that humans take on and then there'll be substantial economic consequences of that. Uh, but when that happens, <laughs> it will be pretty obvious. I don't see, in a world where machines are substituting and taking over most jobs that humans do, I don't think we're going to need like a special test to see if that's going on. That would be just a really big obvious phenomena. (laughs) Today, machines are just a very limited capacity and and they can't substitute for very many things that people do, but slowly they're getting better. And the real interesting test and measure is, you know, what fraction of income is going to, to computers and what jobs are slowly moving over. So every time there's a new job that gets swapped over, like recently, in a sense, checkers are moving over, at least a certain subclass of grocery store checking is being swapped out for computers. And that's, that's an important milestone to notice, and that's something to check off the box and, and notice a trend. But I don't really see much of a point in having a, an ideologically pure, philosophically well-grounded test for whether a machine is really as smart as a person. I mean, if, if, it, you know, if it can win out in competition with a person for a job, you know, hey, you got to hats off, you've done something. Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, what, what sort of positions do you see being taken by uh, computers in, in the uh, not-too-distant future? Well, uh, clearly self-driving cars is, is one of the big things we're all considering. Um, you know, the, the more and more roles for automated um, help menus, things like that. I mean, so far those things have been pretty bad. But there's a huge demand for uh, assistance with products, and uh, it costs a lot to provide people who provide assistance with products. So um, the more you can automate that stuff, the better. 
What do you think of the idea of automating science? <laughs> um, How close are we? I mean, we're, we're we're not very far away from very, some small examples of that. Uh, generically, we're very far away from it. I mean, uh, you know, just being a academic is a complicated social role that has a whole bunch of elements to it, and it would be very hard for a computer to substitute for all of those elements. Uh, it can substitute for some very particular elements. It can, we can, you can do search in spaces, and of course, statistics and, and machine learning are often similar approaches to taking large data sets and trying to discover things. And, but you usually have a partnership between a researcher who manages software that searches for uh, correlations and patterns and tries to test for significance of them and then puts together a publication. So, I mean, in that sense, we've had computer-assisted research for a long time. Um, and you say, so then you say, well, no, but I mean computers do all of the research. And then you say, well, they, they do the discovery and they write the other programs and they write the paper and they present the paper and they take other people out for lunch to, to lobby them for <laughs> being their friends in their, in their, you know, you like me, I like you networks. I mean, you know, how far are we talking here? <laughs> and they devise uh, little uh, political schemes to reference their own papers and exactly, create right. new identities and go under many aliases and reference each other's <laughs> papers. Yeah, yeah. Sounds right. Cool. I mean, real science or academia is a very complicated, very human social process. Mm -hmm. Not that in, it, you know, it intrinsically would have to be, but um, it is at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, okay. Well, that's interesting. So, I mean, but it seems as though this, this Turing test that has just passed, um, the one that was uh, hosted by the Royal Society in London, um, Kevin Warwick was there, Aaron Sloman was there, somebody from the cast of Red Dwarf was there, and there were um, other people probably that, that I know, I, I just don't know of all the people that were there. So, it seems as though it has got a lot of m media attention this time round. There has been instances of the Turing test being so-called passed in, in, in previously. Uh, what's the difference this time, do you think? Is it they I don't know that reached the thirty percent barrier that they hadn't reached before. Or? I, I'm sure there are some rules that have been defined, and some rules and were considered carefully and chosen based on a lot of considerations. And according to some rules, some threshold was passed. But standing back from a distance, asking yes, but how much does all that matter? Hmm. It's just not clear that it matters very much which exact rule they picked and which exact team made what cross what boundary. Basically. You know, we certainly don't have a robust ability anywhere for machines to, to fool hmm. people into thinking they're people. You, you can set very constrained contexts where you don't have very much of a clue and you don't have much to go on and mm -hmm. they're pretending to be a relatively dysfunctional person. <laughs> and in those contexts, maybe you can fool someone into thinking that a machine is a dysfunctional person because uh, you know, dysfunctional people can't do very much. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's going to be a lot easier to convince um, you're a 13-year-old uh, boy from Ukraine who's got a second English as a second language than a uh, fully, fully grown adult. Um, and if we had people with, I guess, sophisticated uh, backgrounds in, in the Turing test, they'd probably do a lot better than, uh, you know, the average Joe Blow down the street trying to pick out whether it was a chatbot or a real human that they were talking to as well. So. Right, but but again, I mean, Turing designed the test as a as a you know s mental problem to imagine trying to think about the idea of an intelligent machine, mm -hmm. and you know that's not fo he wasn't focused on some borderline case where you might be able to fool someone to thinking you're dysfunctional. He was talking about in general over a wide range of cases a machine might be able to fool, and that that would convince you that in fact it was very intelligent. And he's right there. And of course, these actual tests we have are nothing like that capacity. No. But what does it mean to the wider uh, population of people, whether that be the AI in general community? I'm not talking about futurists and right. AGI people. I'm talking about general, like uh, the the populace of people who are interested in AI, whether that be mach uh, um, machine learning or what's a, what's the other one? Something systems, expert systems. Um, it seems like Eugene is based on some form of expert system, Eliza like. Uh, like a uh, code base, but uh, I'm not sure. I don't really know the inner workings there. Um, but yeah, the wider sociological impact, 
you know, I mean, it's been said that people will be convinced of progress in AI once the Turing test has been passed. People have said that, in, uh, you know, so-called <laughs> experts. That's not have true. Said that. Not, not by this definition of the Turing test. I mean, we've had many, many decades of the scenario where people thought a problem was hard, and then somebody made a computer that could solve the problem, and then people decided, I guess that wasn't such a hard problem. And that's just going to keep happening decade after decade. We're not getting out of that loop. No, there's no special way in which any of these upcoming things will get us out of that loop. The only way you know, most people will really be convinced that a machine is very broadly capable is if they are, in fact, very broadly capable. Not that they do one particular thing that used to seem to be hard, but that they are capable of doing a lot of things across a wide range of the, the scope of tasks that people can do. Right. That's the thing that will eventually convince people mm. that you can do it. And until you have that, you just won't convince people. Mm. So you don't think anybody's going to be convinced of the fact, or at least, yeah, or, or that, 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 that AI, or at least highlighted the fact that there has been progress in AI. Um, purely symbolically, uh, you know, this this may be an emblem of AI progress. Whether it's real, whether it, the actual example is a good example of real progress, um, the emblem and the symbol is not n necessarily uh, a very good example of real progress. But still, if people are convinced, um, right, but we're not. I mean, again, we've seen the same thing over and over again, decade after decade. This is not the first time this sort of thing happens. So, so there are people who are like eager to believe that we're making progress, and they love to point to these things and say, "Aha! Look, everybody, mm. you should be scared now. You should be worried now. Mm. You know, because this looked hard before, and we're doing it now." And then, you know, if you're eager to believe, you can use this as support. But if you're eager to be skeptical, you can just say, "I guess that wasn't very hard," because that's what people have been doing. Because, of course. We have passed a lot of these milestones of things that used to look hard, and still machines are in general pretty crappy. Mm -hmm. So from their point of view, it confirms the idea that people keep way overplaying and mm. crying wolf on all these you know, milestones which aren't that important. So and they, keep, they, they think they're confirmed. Right, yeah. Their skepticism is confirmed point. after every yeah. time over and over again. All these people say, look, this thing happened, look, this thing happened, and they go, yeah, I don't see anything else happening. Yeah. So what, right? <laughs> and um, well, that's that's the thing I, I'm worried about is that if people really look at this and see that there's relatively uh, minor sophistication going on behind this chatbot that fooled people, either people are going to think that they're unsophisticated, that human beings are unsophisticated and can be sort of uh, fooled by mere parlor tricks, which of course they can. Of course. <laughs> or that you know. Um, the progress in AI, uh, if this is emblematic of the progress in AI, then maybe people will, will uh, be surprised when there is real progress that, that rears its head. Right. But if you want to make a case for progress, I think you should just be pointing to all the actual tasks that computers are doing out in the world where there's a lot of value being produced by computers doing them, which didn't used to be able to do. And if you make a long enough list of those things, I think you have to eventually be impressed that a lot of progress has been made. But you don't have to be impressed percentage-wise of thinking we're almost there. Mm. Sure. I mean, you could still think we've only come 5% of the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think of this DeepMind? Uh, uh, do you remember DeepMind, the company that was sold to Google last year? Was it I, I've heard about it. Year? Yeah, okay. Um, right. And so, oh, well, let me just briefly explain. Uh, what it could do is learn without being given an instruction on what it was supposed to be learning. Um, and even the data in which it was fed uh, wasn't packaged in such a way that was uh, congenial for it to consume in such a in such a like a, a specific way, and so deep learning um, had streams of pixels given to it without any instructions, just raw sort of streams of pixels, um, and that was pixels from a screen where examples of computer games were being played, uh, and the Deep learning learned how to play these computer games, and then be, be uh, and then learned how to play them very well and beat people uh, um, relatively quickly. Um, and that's an example of, you know, it seems as though that that could be an example of some form of generality, uh, right. some form of like advanced reinforcement uh, learning. So, so, what do you so, think so about that sort of? So, thing? so the background here, um, which we've seen for you know at least seven decades since the start of the whole field of, say, artificial intelligence, 
is that there are many subfields of artificial intelligence. Uh, learning is seen as one subfield. And um, these subfields have uh, different techniques and different uh, tools. Mm -hmm. And in any one subfield, there's a hierarchy of generality. There are tools at a very high level of generality that comply to a wide range of problems. And then there are much more specific tools. And progress in AI is progress in each of the different fields, which go at different rates. And they often go in a, you know, with a short burst and then a slowdown. And progress, most progress happens at, at the small level, at the level of more local context dependent techniques. But once in a while, there are higher level techniques that are found that have uh, some effectiveness. And uh, so the, that's the history. And at any one time, there's usually some field you can point to that's recently been moving the fastest. <laughs> that's recently had the most you know, progress, and often that's a progress at some higher level of generality, because that tends to be the lumpiest thing, the, the, the thing that comes in clumps. Whereas the small, low, you know, low level, uh, context specific thing, that tends to be like an ocean, uh, just a tide of slow increase. So um, we, you know, at any decade or half decade for the last 70 years, you could point to particular progress that's been made in particular fields um, that happen to be especially exciting them. And so today, one of the fields that's making most rapid progress is uh, machine learning and the hierarchical learning structures uh, that the people call deep learning is uh, one of the more exciting developments. But uh, I don't think it's out of the range of the usual progress that we've seen over 70 years where different fields uh, at any one time you know, leap ahead temporarily while other fields are not jumping ahead so fast. So um, it's, it's good. <laughs> I'm glad that the animation there, I'm glad they're applying it to a right range of things, but it's not like solved computer learning or, or, or machine learning. That, that's still a hard problem. It's not quite as hard as it was, but it's still very hard. And so we're still very long way away from having a general solution there. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Well, um, well where do you, when do you think we'll have a general solution? Just you know, <laughs> as, a, as a, a side question. Well, this it comes down to a, a basic question here of where the solution will lie. So uh, I mentioned this hierarchy of there's abstract high-level principles that have very wide scope, and then each one of them tends to have more power and, and advantage, and then there are lots of little things. And um, people have different concepts about where the ultimate success will be. So some people think that uh, eventually we'll find a few very high-level principles uh, you know the, the the Maxwell's equations of intelligence, and when we find those, then it'll you know open the floodgates, and then everything else will be vastly easier than it was, and and that's the moment when we'll have artificial intelligence is when somebody finds the ten magic equations. Ah, right, um, the, like the eleven secret herbs and spices. From right, Kentucky. right, but. I, I don't buy that. That is my experience in artificial intelligence research. And, and I, for your listeners' point of view, I was an AI researcher for nine years, from uh, 84 to 93. So it was a while back. Um, there, there just aren't very many high-level things to find. Uh, people usually like keep finding the same high-level things over and over again, packaging them in different things. And most progress is just in lots of little details. And another important thing to notice is in a lot of these fields, progress in algorithms, that is progress in learning how to better structure programs, has tracked pretty closely progress in hardware. And it doesn't look like that's a coincidence. It looks, and it doesn't look like the hardware is being driven by the software, so most likely it's the software being driven by the hardware. That is, uh, we're getting better at doing software in part because as we get better hardware, we can experiment with a wider range of ways to do things. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that suggests that <laughs> We need to see more continued hardware gains uh, to realize more software gains in the future. So uh, we won't discover, if there are big equations, we won't discover them until we have enough hardware to make it cheap and easy to try out some ideas related to them. Sure, like Thelman of Induction was actually um, was a thing, was a thing in Thelman of's mind and in theory uh, way before we had the computing power to really do it. And yeah, or, or we were willing to apply the computing power that we had to right. the problem. So since we see software progress track hardware classes so closely, that you know creates a strong argument for the idea that we will continue to see a steady rate of software progress as hardware 
increases at a steady rate, and that there won't be a sudden discovery of, of 10 magic equations uh, that realize everything. It'll just be a mess of detail. I mean, similarly in biology, I mean, what, what we understand about um, by organisms like bacteria or even you know, mammals or things like that is there aren't 10 magic equations about how to make a bacteria or a mammal. There's just a big mess of details. <laughs> it's just a lot of little things you have to get right. I mean, there are some overall principles that, that it's useful to pay attention to, but they don't get you very far. You just have to get a lot of little things right. And that's our familiar you know, experience with software in the rest of the world. That's how software is. Most of what doing software well is managing complexity well. Why? Because in order to do software well, you just have to do lots and lots of things right. And the key thing is how to get them all together in, in a way working together. And that's the hard problem with software. And I don't think intelligent software is any different in that sense than all the rest of the software. It's all about managing a lot of little things and getting them all to work together well. It seems like it's a pretty difficult thing to predict then. Or it's <laughs> straightforward. I mean, I would say if we have a relatively steady rate of progress, uh, that gives you a basis for making a steady rate of progress prediction into the future. So, so, how, so how here's you know how I do the numbers. When you're stumbling on the right 11 secret herbs and spices. If there are such things, but if there aren't such things, you don't have to worry about finding them. Right. So, so it, I used to be in AI research 20 years ago, yes. and so I meet people at conferences who are also in AI research 20 years ago, and I ask them, in your field of AI that you know best, how far have we come in the last 20 years from where we were 20 years ago to the goal of human level abilities in your specialty subfield? And the usual answer I get is 5 to 10%. Mm -hmm. So, and no noticeable acceleration. So, if you project that forward, you got two to four centuries. Mm -hmm. So, you say, we were making slow to steady progress. We should expect to continue to do it. Two to four centuries, if hardware improves at the same rate it's been improving. Now, we have some reasons to be concerned that rates of hardware improvement are actually slowing down now. Mm -hmm. So Moore's laws re reach some, some obstacles that seem to be making it temporarily slow down. We have some theoretical reasons to expect slowdowns to continue. And if that happens, it, it could put it off farther than two to four centuries. Mm -hmm. But two to four centuries isn't that far on a cosmological timescale. It still means eventually it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And you should... <laughs> Somebody, sometime along the line, should start to take that seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, I mean, is it useful to try and predict this stage then, um, a time like a, a possible tentative timeline for AI? Well, I, I just gave a a tentative timeline uh, yeah. on, based on progress like we've had before. Of yeah. course, you know, I personally think that a brain emulation approach will succeed before that approach succeeds, and so we're likely to have artificial intelligence earlier, but not necessarily earlier than another century. So sure. okay. uh, I think brain emulations will appear, say, within roughly a century, which is faster than two to four centuries, mm. but, but still a ways away. So I don't think it's around the corner. It's not next year or 10 years or even 20 years. Mm. It's, it's a ways off. Before, before we started recording this video, you mentioned that there were some uh, interesting ways to, um, for, for, for humans to interact with computers, not just through text. And, and it seems as though the Turing test is pretty much uh, revolved around how you know text chat can uh, appear to be human. A chatbot can appear to be human just by sending text to a panel of judges. Um, let's drill deeper into ways that we can sort of improve models for uh, predicting how well computers can interact with humans. Um, well, the, the result I was particularly found particularly striking is the result that apparently, I haven't looked at the details, uh, they've now got computer face readers that can read emotions and faces better than people can. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, yeah, that may be, be true now, but it quite plausibly would be in the next 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so that seems to have a substantial usefulness in the wider social world. That's a you know, very useful tool to have, and that will change social interactions, of course, then people will become more defensive. They'll, they'll be more circumspect in how they express their emotions and how they try to fake them. So there'll be an arms race, uh, and it's not clear where that would go. But, uh, you know, of course, if, and if you have like on video that you're, you and I are doing on video now, now, you might have an automated software assistant that, you know, massages your facial appearance to make your emotions look more sincere and to take out signs of insincere emotions. Mm. So, you know, we can imagine... <laughs> you know, going those directions. Uh, 
But you know that sounds much more plausible than a lot of interactions with bots because you know the only way that they can even make bots anywhere remotely, you know, something that you might not tell as a human is if you make the interaction very narrow bandwidth where there's very little information going back and forth and you have very little context. But the more rich the interaction is, the more there's audio and video and a history and other you know, ways to probe in various ways, then just it just becomes much harder to imagine bots, you know, directly substituting for people uh, without people knowing it. But you can imagine bots assisting in your image. So I can imagine, and certainly in the next 20 years, 10 or 20 years, you've got automated, say, Skype video assistance that smooths your skin, mm. makes your face a little more symmetrical, mm -hmm. takes out the the uh, you know signs of of insincere emotions. Uh, maybe adds a little vibrato to your voice, just like you know that now they have like singers have special software that helps singers uh, sound more uh, you know professional in their singing. But all the rest of us could have things like that that clean up our voice in and our time. video appearance, right? And mm -hmm. video and in real time. So th those sound like quite likely things to appear. Uh, and there'll be this arms race where we're trying to like massage our appearance at the same time we're trying to detect. Massages and uh, you know illusions on the other end, and it's not clear where that will go. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know how how that will be acceptable. I think it'll become socially acceptable the more that people do it. Um, but it'll be very it'll in that scenario it may seem very difficult to actually know what's really going on in people's minds if if the proje the projection that they're giving is massaged so well that our intuitive Abilities to detect untruth and uh, and lies or fraud may be sort of uh, diminished by us right. only having access to people's avatars rather than their real faces. Right. So it might diminish the attractiveness of Skype interactions relative to in-face interactions uh, because it might be harder to fake. I mean, you might be able to put some like automated bits under your makeup that that move your face around a little, but that's probably just a lot harder. <laughs> So uh, you know, it's probably harder to massage your appearance in person. You mean like subdermal, also, subdermal implants that actually raise right, your exactly. eyebrows and make you smile? Exactly. On the right. <laughs> Some someday that should be possible. That's a little ways off. But in person, it's also going to be harder to you know pretend that you're not using assistant software when you are. So you know, there's a whole glass hole phenomena of you know Google Glass being used by some people and other people objecting to it and. Um, trying to shame people into not using Google Glass, hmm. and you know, eventually maybe you can have you know contact lenses that people can't tell you're using, but we're a ways off from that. Hmm. So in the intermediate time, I expect you know, in-person facial interactions. It might be you know, not a, not okay to use those things. Hmm. Right. Yeah, but. I mean the benefits that people can get from such things, like the the utility of having like augmented reality goggles, um, you know, that put a layer over the over real reality is is pretty striking. Uh, how much do people care whether they're being lied to or not? I mean, people know that they're they being lied to by by advertising I, 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 all the time, but you know they're not running around tearing down the posters. I, but I, I can tell you with some confidence that people are actually care a lot about the people around them and reading whether they're sincere. Now, I don't think people mind that much when people are insincere about around them, but I do think they want to know. Hmm. That is, you know, we, we constantly have lots of uh, social fictions and politenesses whereby we say things that we don't fully mean and we, we don't expect people to fully mean. Hmm. But we do, or we are eager to track those things hmm. and distinguish people who are just being polite from people who seem more sincere. That's an important thing that we're, our minds are just tuned to. So I expect we will want to know. We certainly will want to know what other people know about us. So if other people are detecting things, we'll want to have detectors that tell us what other people are seeing in us. Mm. And so it reminds me of um, Jemais Cassio's idea of a participatory panopticon, where everybody is like little brothers and sisters running around with video cameras and artificial intelligence agents on their shoulders detecting emotions in people's faces, heat signatures, electrical signatures and pheromones and things like that to give them more of an impression about what's going on. With multiple perspectives on, on any given scenario right. it's very hard to Photoshop and manipulate any particular digital stream 
Um, so, and so aggregate these digital streams and it, f it becomes very difficult to sort of uh, manipulate them all consistently. So therefore, uh, the, the thesis is, one of the theses is it may be very difficult to lie in public. I think an early test will be the freedom to film and record policemen doing their duties. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not as, <laughs> well, <laughs> But well, it's not clear that people get away with it. So um, in the past, you know, there's, there's a standard story about how police are supposed to be interacting with people. And then there's the way people have been, police have been interacting. And of course, the standard way they're supposed to be interacting is a lot more cumbersome and awkward and gets in the way of their doing what they want to do. And so in practice, quite commonly, police are not following all the rules and procedures that they're supposed to. And now that more people have cameras around, they're often catch police violating these principles and sometimes they are able to use that to enforce these rules to punish people for violating them but equally often it seems the police are punishing people for trying to film them and they're basically saying yes you officially have this rule but don't try to use it it's just like you you, you know if a policeman pulls you over you are allowed to insult, insult them you can tell them all sorts of really bad names and legally they wouldn't be allowed to retaliate but you don't really want to try that because you know they have extra legal ways <laughs> to punish you for that sort of thing. Uh -huh, and, broken tail light. <laughs> oh, look. <laughs> right. <gotta> right. So <laughs> the same sort of thing can be used to discourage people from filming mm. police. And so I don't think it's clear which way that's going to go, but that's an example of the tension between the convenience of maintaining our usual fictions without clear evidence of violations versus the convenience of all the things we could do with these tools if we were to give up on the usual fictions. And it's not clear to me which wins. Because So when I think of people using Google Glass to do stuff, I don't actually come up with a long list of high value applications <laughs> that's strong enough to overcome the you know many un un discomfort that many people feel that somebody in the coffee shop or in the party is filming them without their knowledge. Hmm. So I, I'm not sure you know which way that's going to go hmm. in the short run. I mean, in the long run, it seems much more you know, harder to imagine because, you know, the recording devices can get smaller and more isolated and, and harder to detect. And so in the long run, it seems like it's harder to win at preventing these things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's an arms race and could be that the detection technology gets better fast too to, to see who is filming something or recording something. Are people, do you think people are more concerned about other denizens of society watching each other with video recorders rather than the surveillance like the government watching them yeah I do <laughs> that is uh, you know there are many things people care about the people around them knowing they don't that much care if the government somewhere has somebody who has a file that knows it because most people don't actually care what the government thinks of them there are exceptions of course political activists of various sorts who who could be in trouble with the government and they might care but most people aren't in that role most people if the government knows something about them it doesn't affect them much now if you know if somebody if the more corrupt say the police are and the more easy it would be for a friend of theirs to pay somebody off to get access to the government records then the more people will be concerned about government records but if the government is is actually pretty good about limiting access to the records I expect most people don't actually care that much. So this you, lot, yeah, go on. I mean, like the standard saying is, a rich man is somebody who wakes, makes more money than his wife's sister's husband. Uh, it just highlights that envy is usually pretty local to our context. We're not actually very envious of Bill Gates, but we're envious of people around us in our social world. Similarly, we're for concern about privacy. We're not actually very concerned about people far away in some obscure organization learning stuff about us if they're not going to act on it or tell anybody around us that we care about. What we mainly care about is the people around us knowing things about us mm. in our social world. Mm -hmm. So I guess that, that's interesting um, that people are more concerned in their local world. Uh, <laughs> but I mean the world's changing. Our, 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 I guess the limits of our concern seem to be based on Dunbar numbers that we, like the yep. amount of people we were, we were uh, biologically adept at uh, monitoring in the ancestral environment. It's uh, right. Do you think, is there re re any evidence that that, that if the amount of people that we can really monitor and care about is growing? 
you know, well, people have a thousand Facebook friends, but of course they don't know them very well. Yes. Uh, you know, you know, 20 years ago, I was, you know, people were very concerned about internet privacy. Mm. Uh, I think because uh, it, from a long distance, they were in sort of a far mental mode where principles and are important. And so uh, in that abstract mental mode, people were very concerned about their privacy, even with respect to the government. Uh, because it was all in the abstract and nothing concrete around them. But as soon as we started to have concrete things, benefits we could get by giving up our privacy, <laughs> you know, ways we could look at cat videos and, and other sorts of things, uh, then people were really quite willing to type in their personal information in order to get access to all these things. And once in the habit of doing that, people got pretty blasé about, you know, fine, I don't care, tell them where I live, <laughs> let me see the cat video. Uh, so. Uh, it's not, and, and now that people are in that habit, it's just not. It's really hard to put them in this distant, abstract state of mind of, uh, you know, oh, what if 1984? I mean, for most people in the world, 1984 is just not a very plausible image of of the world around them, and something that could happen soon. So I'm afraid people are not scared. Hmm. Well, what, what do you think of the the um, life logging idea? This whole thing that. If people walk around with um, right. video cameras on their chest or on their face, it's not exactly the same as Google Glass, I guess. That could be one of the applications for Google Glass. But it's just about monitoring self uh, and trying to keep a record of self in, in terms of what, what's going on in, in the environment, the local bubble around self. Um, right. Um, tracking so that, food intake and tracking conversations, trying to track sleep and trying to track you know where you are. Um, yeah, and locking this over time and grabbing personal metrics. But that also is sort of an invasion of anybody's privacy as long as they enter the bubble of that, the you know, perceptual bubble of the person doing life logging. Right, I think people will object much more to life logging of conversations than they will of your blood pressure and your temperature and, you know, food intake and things like that. So, mm. you know, it just remains to be seen how people can police these things. Mm. Uh, so, you know... Obviously, so for example, most people have a phone on their pocket. If the phone can be audio recording, it will be really hard for people around them to, to stop that and to monitor that. Google Glass is something they can monitor. They can see that you don't have something sitting over your eye. And so for a while, they will you know, shame you into not using that in many contexts. But things that they can't detect, then those things will just happen, basically. So you know, one obvious prediction is audio recording and audio processing is just going to be a lot more common than video for a while. Mm. So ubiquitous um, recording devices will be socially acceptable as long as it's like out of sight and out of mind. Well, you're right because it's very hard to enforce. So, uh, mm. so I would expect you know these mood readers that can read the mood of a face are very useful, but they'll be harder to to actually deploy in many contexts than an audio reader. If you could read a tone of voice, uh, then that would be something a lot more people would actually use. Because they'll have, you know, out of sight audio readers for a while. Oh yes. Well, I mean, they're out of sight now. If you got a phone in your pocket. Right. And it's just a matter of getting their resolution and that sort of thing up. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's this um, technology called a vector microphone, and an ordinary microphone just records a, a time series of pressure, which is a, a single number. But a vector microphone records a time series of the direction at which the waves were moving. And so if you have several of these direction microphones, you can actually pinpoint the spatial location of speakers, people, of sound sources. Hmm. So you, you could imagine a phone with four um, vector microphones that could then be recording the sound in the room and where all the sound is coming from. Including, and, uh, the, including echoes, right? It also, like in a room full of twenty conversations, it could probably like distinguish them all, hmm. because by using the vector, it can distinguish. You know, it can filter out conversations coming from different directions. Wow! And so, so you and I, in a room full of twenty people talking all at the same time, we find it. I find it very hard to like disentangle them, hmm. but a vector microphones could automatically disentangle them and then have a recording of each of the conversations. Hmm. So, um, and th those are actually relatively cheap devices. They're they're not widely, you know, built into phones yet. But there's no particular reason they couldn't be. 
Mm. So, so again, that's in the direction of things that are out of sight. Yeah, sure. And so I, I, would, I would expect more of vector microphone processing mm. and recording of who's where in the room and who's saying what. You know, rather than video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Google Glass has taken a long time to take off. Um, it's yes, been in development you noticed. Phase. Yeah, of course. But do you think it's because, one of the factors is because it's actually in view and people know that they're being, like, like it, you, they're being potentially recorded. Um, I, I think the, that's a big market barrier, yeah. Hmm. It's just, I mean, the, it's going to be hard for many people to be willing to just put it on all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, a specialty thing where you take it out once in a while and stick it on for specialty purposes is just a very different product, the one that you just typically have on all the time. Mm. And it's also technically challenging to actually construct all these applications that would actually be useful. I mean, mm. they've done nice demos imagining a world full of, you know, stores sending you signals and you know, maps all available with information that could be overlaid on everything you see, but that's really pretty technically challenging to construct all that. Mm. Uh, and so if, unless there's a big enough market to support it, they do the, do the numbers and say, you know, not ready yet. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, all those technophobes have been sort of, uh, technophiles have been sort of waiting for this to come out, but um, it's not apparent that it's ever going to. <laughs> I mean, when, when has been the release date? I mean, I, I don't know what it is now. It used to be like years ago, right? I don't know. I mean, I expect something will be released sometime, but the question is really, how many people do you expect to buy this thing? Mm. Mm. And, uh, you know, what do the... Well, well, how many software vendors will offer software support for it, and how many you know, databases will there be, etc.? I mean, mm. the glasses by itself isn't very useful unless you have all the supporting infrastructure mm. to make it useful. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, my, my colleague Tyler Cowan said he got a Google Glass and tried it for a while and wasn't very impressed. That's the last I heard of it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess it's one of these watch this space uh, things and see what happens. Really. Right. It's very hard to predict how large amounts of people will actually uh, take on such remember, a thing. You remember the initial release of the Segway? Yeah. Right. I mean, that uh, was. You I, know, I, I don't remember it, but like, yeah, <laughs> I, I, like, tell me about it. Yeah. I mean, but you know, it, that at least had a more plausible case in a sense for being the beginning of a revolution. You actually had something that, you know, most people could stand on that they could go a lot faster through. I mean, people do walk around a lot, right? I mean, mm. walking is a big thing we do. Mm. So if you could like give people a thing that would help them walk faster and yeah. then it would work in all sorts of environments, mm. that sounds like it could be a big deal. And mm. in a sense, the Segway make good on the promise of the actual device and what it could do. But not enough people said to themselves, yeah, that's what I want to do. Hmm. You know, if, if there's just a few people using a Segway, it's a different sort of project product hmm. with a hmm. different sort of potential support and application. I mean, Segways without much support are different than Segways with a world that supports them. Right? So it's, I'm making the analogy to Google Glass. Hmm. Now, a world where there's just a few people using Google Glass is just a different world than a world where most people use it. Hmm. The same way for a Segway, a world where a couple of people have Segways, it's a very specialty product. Nothing is adapted particularly for it. There isn't much supporting infrastructure. Legal regimes are, you know, biased against it. And then that sort of situation, it, it makes you look weird. It makes you look, you know, full of yourself. Right. Then, well, um, you know, people don't do it. Hmm. At the very least, I think Google Glass seems general enough, or something like it could be made to be general enough to be uh, used in specialty fields. Medical sure. or like um, automotive, even like when you're trying to fix a car. <laughs> right, <laughs> what right. model of car is this, and where do I find the carburetor? <laughs> where, you know, right. Where, where so are in fact, yeah. you can imagine Google Glass most commonly used in you know physical workplaces. You know, hmm. a a person who um, you know you know does janitorial work or is a repair person at a big plant. Right. I mean, so you can imagine if if you have to go find a leak in a big plant. And you have to like go around and find things that are wrong. Then if Google Glass gives you a schematic of things over your eyes that tells you what you're looking at and where you're going, mm. right? I, I can imagine for a physical jobs like that, mm. uh, Google Glass could have a substantial advantage. And then you might it just might be standard equipment for some sorts of physical jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that might be a, a quick way to make for some people to make money. <laughs> Develop the application right. specific to particular organizations, uh, floor schemers, and and technical. Um, designs of whatever products they're, they're selling. Automotive right. companies that uh, deal with m various models of cars that 
have different sort of uh, I guess architecture under the hood how do you how does any one mechanic know how to deal with that without looking up a manual <laughs> well that's still a pretty challenging you know app yeah. app to write that yeah. is uh, I mean an app that could like take an image of a car engine in front of you and then map it onto all the parts in a, in some catalog especially if part of it had been somewhat disassembled <laughs> yes yeah. that yeah. would be a hard app to write right but, i mean I'm, i imagine it could be something like a like a map like a google map device except maybe 3d um in such that you know looking at a like a toyota corolla um circa 2005 um, compared to I know a Datsun Stanza circa 1984 or whatever, um, <laughs> yeah, there's a big difference, right? Uh, uh, right. And knowing where all the parts are and what they are um, could be very useful. I'm not sure so much about Datsun Stanzas anymore, but who's maintaining them? I don't know. But <laughs> yeah, I, think I don't really know. Mm. I mean, you imagine it's more useful if there's just a big library of rarely, rarely used or rarely paired things. So uh, you imagine like a or, you know, a electric repair person or something who does vacuum cleaners and dishwashers and a wide range of things. Well, mm -hmm. you know, there's just too many things for them to know all of it, and then something could be more useful. Mm -hmm. That was just a general schematic, but mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, well, back to the Turing test. Now that like this has been passed, do you think it's got, like people will accept it as a, uh, um, an official pass of the Turing test, uh, or is it just another media nah. wave? There's there's lots of ways to raise the bar. Mm. There's so many ways that they'll continue to have you know Turing test version X and whether people pass it or not. I'm sure, uh, you know, th there's just a vast space of possible tests that you can continue to develop, and that'll be mildly interesting to see what passes. Um, yeah, it, I think it will be very interesting to see what kind of um, tests people design in the future in response to an unsophisticated chatbot um, fooling a panel of judges one day in, in England at the Royal Society. But, <laughs> but for the purpose of these media events, it's, it's kind of important that the tests be canonical, that there not be a million variations. And so that's part of these, the trade-off here. Mm -hmm. uh, a community needs to pick some arbitrarily, if necessary, canonical test as the one they focus attention on so that when in the rare times when it's passed it's it's newsworthy hmm. uh, but then of course it is somewhat arbitrary and there isn't anything particular that follows from that particular test being passed hmm. but in a sense that's kind of what you have to do to 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 get attention right to pick these milestones so winning the you know beating the best human chess player right there's a sense in which you you know there was no that passing that milestone isn't especially important compared to beating the tenth best human chess player or the hundredth best human chess player, right? <laughs> or or beating him with his hand tied behind his back or you know, whatever it is, right? <laughs> but we just have to pick these canonical milestones in order to, you know, agree on what to pay attention to, otherwise there's too many things to pay attention to. And so we, we all make a note when some milestone is passed. Hmm. And so the question is what will be the canonical milestones to define? That was my next question. <laughs> right, and, and it's somewhat arbitrary. It's somewhat arbitrary. It just has to be things that make sense to people as a milestone. So, you know, so certainly, you know, if you could have, you know, somebody call in a radio show, if you could have a bot call into a radio show, and you know, have the host talk to it for a minute or two, and then not mention that it was a bot, not know that it was a bot, right? And now you're starting to, you know, enter into people's world. I think it would be at these canonical places in the world where you might enter and people might not know that you were there. Have you heard of the Steve Wozniak Turing test? <laughs> no. Okay. What is it? Uh, it's just like a, it's a computer's ability to go into any coffee shop in some part in America and make a, a nice coffee regardless of, you know, the, the nuances of its surrounding. Available. Right. Yeah, that'll be a long time to, before that sort of thing is passed. Okay. But again, you know, the, the whole discussion about which are the right tests like presumes that there is a right test, that, that there is some concept of what a smart machine really is as opposed to a machine that looks smart. And that the real test is determining whether it's really smart. And I think that's, in a sense, fundamentally mistaken. There's just a vast wide range of tasks to do. And uh, as machines are able to do tasks that, at say, human level or better, that's a thing that matters for the economy. 
Uh, but no one of them matters a lot because there are so many of them. Having a machine that could simultaneously do many tasks is more interesting, but that's a much harder to test to set up. Uh, to say that this one thing was able to simultaneously do many tasks. Uh, so we tend to focus on a particular task and whether a machine can do it. And you know, we say it's cool. You know, it's, it's impressive when a machine can drive a car. We don't say, well, I want to see a machine that can drive a car or a plane or a submarine. <laughs> and you know, the same machine has to do all three of those, or I'm not impressed. Well, you know, <clears throat> you could set that up, but in a sense, it's artificial because in the real world, we don't need something that can do all three of those. We just need things that can do any one of them. Hmm. Well, industrially, yes. But what about household robotics? I mean, there's a lot of things a robot could do in the house that we would like to uh, farm off to robots. Right. And so that's a problem that you need a device that can do a wide range of tasks there because you don't have room for very many devices in the home. Um, but that's the reason why it's going to be a long time before you actually have one. Uh, so we're really quite a long way off from having a home, you know, something that can do half of your household chores, say, or even a tenth of your household chores, uh, you know, as effectively as you can. I mean, they're still struggling to have something that vacuums halfway decent. Hmm, right, yeah. So do you think, would you be surprised if the home robot industry took off within the next 20 years? Yeah, actually. <laughs> I mean, to, to, in terms of, I mean, I, as a curiosity, I'm sure it would exist. I'm sure there'll be, you know, hobbyists and particular things they could do. But in terms of most people actually getting value by having one do a substantial fraction of their chores, that's actually pretty hard nut to crack. Hmm. So I would brace. So again, I mean, my basic attitude is there's just this long-term trend, and we should just presume it's going to continue. It's actually not been that unsteady a trend. We see slowly computers getting better, and we slowly take on more tasks. And people have actually been able to forecast reason, some reasonably well ahead of time how much computing power it will take to be able to do any given task. And you know, when the computing power is getting near the threshold, then they make startup companies and they start investing in things. And then there's lots of you know, uncertainty about exactly how far to go. But uh, we're, we, you know, we, we have this long, steady trend. And, and in a sense, you know, there's less surprise here than news discussion wants there to be. <laughs> You know, so, so for the news purposes, we want to say, ooh, this thing happened. What could that mean? Does that mean these other things are just around the corner? Who knows? Stay tuned. Film at 11, right? I mean, you want, you're, you're generating uncertainty as if this was all up in the air, as if who knows what could come out of this box because it did this, and we have no idea how these things work. Mm -hmm. But we do have ideas how these things work, and we do have ideas how much work it is to make a home cleaning robot or a driving robot or things like that. And there's whole industries of people working out how soon they think that's going to be feasible and deciding whether it's time to try it yet or not. And those sorts of people know that we're really a long way away from robots that can do a wide range of tasks that we, that we all want done. We are just still early in the process of making machines that replace humans at a wide range of tasks. I still think it's, you know, a best guess at the rate we've been going in another two to four centuries. Hmm. So do you predict there to be no specific spikes in any area of, like, robotics or... Um knowledge work uh, taken over by AI uh, no in, spikes, in, the, in, in the next hundred years? No spikes bigger than we've seen in the last 70, or are not substantially bigger. I mean, we've seen mild, you know, some areas jumping a little head faster than other areas, and we've seen, you know, things crossing thresholds where you finally have enough ability to do something where you didn't before. And, and that's and in a sense, that second threshold is the mo most of these spikes you see are just finally having enough finally being good enough, having hardware that's cheap enough so that you can do a task cost effectively. Because once you finally pass that threshold, you, you want to scale up prototypes and re release it on a large scale, and then large scale uses means costs can come down quickly, and you specialize a lot, and so you get spikes just because you suddenly have a big effort that goes into where, an area because you are passing a threshold. So, I mean, I think some of the spikes that, that have... Uh been happening over the last 70 years, like for instance the internet and the ability for people to communicate much more easily, uh, mobile phones in people's pockets, computing power at fingertips, This, that, that's pretty significant, large spikes you know, in the grand scheme of things. So it right. still would be useful even if the spikes weren't any larger than the ones we've we um or, or, right. yeah, we've already seen. Um, how do we well, predict two... the next ones? 
So there's two kinds of spikes here, just to be clear and distinguish. Yeah. One kind of spike is due to like deep learning, yeah. a discovery of a new technique or to, a way to do something. And the other kind of spike is due to finally being good enough to, d to do a task. You always knew that was possible, you just didn't know when exactly you'd be able to do it. So most of the things you mentioned, the internet or you know, smartphones, or self-driving cars, those are about spikes in the applications. They aren't about any sudden improvement in the techniques. They are about finally being good enough to do something and then, uh, you know, an application area that takes off because of that. So, I mean, the internet was feasible before. It just was expensive and small and then eventually it reached a threshold where it could be big and cheap. Same way for smartphones, same way for self-driving cars. And so the way you predict those in the future is to look at the various kinds of applications and have specialists say, how far, how far away are we? You know, what's the best prototype that tries to do this? And how far away is it? And how much would it cost at today's hardware? And where, if we project hardware costs coming down, when does it reach a, you know, market feasibility point where you might be able to make a profit at that? Hmm. And there are lots of people out there doing that sort of thing all the time in various application areas. They're saying, when is it potentially time to do this? And when time to do that? And what's possible? And, you know, those people tend to know a lot about what's likely to happen, but they don't get quoted so much by exciting press releases and news stories because that's trying to push on the story of who knows what and anything could happen and therefore isn't this exciting film at 11. Hmm. So, have you heard of E-Room's Law? No. Uh, the number of new drugs that have been approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has sort of... Uh, um, been relatively deflationary. It seems to have like a peak down, yes. while, and it's going down, 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 down. Um, there is some technologies which may slow or reverse the trend. Um, and I recently did an interview with a guy called Donald Ingeber, who's been working on developing tissue on chips, essentially organs on chips, like a like for instance a model of a lung that sort of breathes like a lung, not a whole lung, but the tissue, and it sort yeah. of expands and contracts, has blood flow, has oxygen flow, um, can be sort of contaminated with certain uh, bacteria, can be have drugs interact with it, and can automate without actually testing on tissue inside a human, um, it can automate in vitro, so to, so to speak. Um, the, the, the types of drugs that maybe we could benefit from um, and might make it a lot easier for drugs to actually get through the pipeline of uh, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, usually taking 15 years and billions of dollars to do. Right. Um, and that would be a, a, like a, quite a significant change if this project which is doing would take off. Right. Bear in mind that um, just recently I found out that the Food and Drug Administration had, I don't know if it was a sponsor or if it was some form of reward, but there's millions of dollars, like uh, 75 million or 65 million dollars, um, and that's not counting other sponsorship from uh, private enterprise and sure. stuff as well. I mean, drug testing is terribly expensive and terribly time consuming, and so ways to make them more, more efficient has, there are huge interests parties trying to work on that, but they've been trying for a while and failing. So, I mean, this is this generic situation in innovation. There, at any one time, there's lots of ideas for new things. Uh, most of those ideas will not work out. A few of them will, and ahead of time, it's hard to know which, but roughly we see the rate at which things work out and track the rate, and that's the base, good basis for projecting the rate at which you'll see future things pan out. Um, you know, I, I, I was... You know, a couple of years ago, everybody was really excited about the Human Genome Project and how that was going to make drugs so much easier to develop and so much easier to target, and you know, and that didn't work out. Well, it hasn't yet. But, right. Um, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's still it's still prohibitively expensive. The the one thousand dollar per genome threshold has been breached this year. It's still that's expensive for a lot of people, and people aren't just going to spend a thousand dollars. Um, just well, sure, arbitrary but e getting their full genome sequence. But, e but even when everybody's genome sequence, genome sequence, it's still not clear that we're, we know how to design drugs better because of that. You know, people were hoping that that would make it easier to design better drugs, mm -hmm. and, and that hasn't been realized yet. Right, okay. Yeah, fair enough. Um, hmm. 
yeah, I've heard some commentary uh, on this, and at the moment we're still going to, through a phase of understanding what the genome really means. Um, and that could be a really long phase, because it wasn't built to be understandable. No. <laughs> there's, there's no documentation, there's, you know, whatever modularity there is somewhat random, yeah. and um, that's a barrier to understanding, it's a substantial barrier. Mm -hmm. So, oh, it's an open question how much it will be understandable. Well, to what extent do you think alarming trends, like uh, the amount of drugs getting passed by the FDA or the amount of patents being granted on drugs, um, going down and down, um, other, think, other people like look at climate change, looking at stats there, um, are these trends going to inspire people to try and turn them around, or, or should we be, use, be using existing trends to predict? Um, well, that's, that's a good... It's a good basic question. I, I think the the first order thing to say is that we're in a rich world and so we aren't scared very easily. So scenarios where we see, you know, growth or innovation slowing down and that scares us into, you know, releasing some barriers that we've had over it and being a little less cautious are a little less plausible until we get more scared. So you know, in a place like China, which is just feels more aggressive and at risk or not growing fast enough, they are willing to take, take more chances with a range of things, and so they are more eager to innovate. And in a place like the United States or Australia, we are rich and comfortable, hmm. and people argue that you know your processes of regulation are, are preventing regulation, and you know we can't have flying cars, and we can't have nice drugs, and there's all sorts of thing, nice things we can't have because regulation is overbearing and cautious, and people say, yeah, but it's stopping some bad things from happening, and that's what I want because we're rich and comfortable, and we don't need as much innovation as long as things are nice and people don't die randomly because of bad accidents, I'm okay. Hmm. And so, in a sense, we're rich and comfortable, and that's probably a, a basic cause of the re slowdown in innovation is that we are just being more cautious, uh, not only individually, but socially in terms of making people jump through more hoops before they're allowed to do things. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting phenomenon. And yes, I, I believe you're right. The Chinese are willing to try more left-of-field things than the average American... Um, and they'll suffer more for it. Yeah. Well, they'll I mean, they will have more things to go wrong. However... Um, they may be able to leapfrog in um, some of the technical achievements the Americans have made, and that might scare Americans a bit. If the Chinese end up developing some really serious <laughs> right. technologies, then America might say, "Oh, what? What's going on? Hey, look, let's get back in right. the race." And yeah, so <laughs> if if China were to start to seem to be ahead of the U.S. or Europe on not just a few random little things that we didn't care much about, but on many big Many-ish things, things yeah. then we might, you know start to be scared and, and be scared enough into relaxing a bit. On the other hand, by the time China gets that big, it may be slowing down and it might be rich and comfortable mm. and it might be putting a lot of brakes on because uh, it, it is can afford to. Mm. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Well, We've well, had this history of, of some countries getting rich and other countries being behind and catching up going along for a long time. So this isn't the first time we've seen this scenario. No. Okay. Right. So what What's an example? Well, Britain and the United States, for example. I mean, Britain was far ahead of the United States. The United States basically cheated and copied lots of stuff and did everything we can to steal British technical secrets hmm. and allowed more variation here in the U.S. so that we could like try more things out and, and to, to jump ahead. And we did get rich, and we got up to the point where Britain was and even a little farther ahead, and then we decided we were rich and comfortable. And so we, you know... We didn't have to be as eager and, and grasping as we had been when we were behind and trying to catch up. So Americans are worried about safety, and that's the thing. Um, that's the reason why such a technology of these organs on chips, so to call it, that Donald Engbo is uh, looking at, as being the sort of technologies that um, America may be okay with developing, because it's not going to put people in the line of fire um, and so it, it may mean that uh, drugs, for certain drugs, can get through this big pipeline a lot quicker, and that could mean big change. Well, the the risk is, I mean, people change. say, fine, do whatever you want on your chips, but when you finally have your drug, then you got to do the standard big randomized trial to show us that it works. So right. yep. the risk is, is, is would be at the point of saying, oh, your chip thing was good enough, we don't need the big standardized trial. And that will feel risky to people when they are asked to approve things 
hmm. not through the usual mechanism because they say, well, what if what if this oh, isn't yeah, right? Yeah, yes. I, I still believe there will need to be human trials. It's just that it's lessening the amount of human trials and animal trials, mind you, because like you, a lot of the trials that we uh, rely on are animal trials before we go to human trials. And animals right. don't necessarily translate to humans as well as we'd like to think. Uh, and but I think it's that last step in the process that's the most expensive and slow. So if you speed up the early steps, you're not necessarily solving the hard problem. Hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. So anyway, like, um, is there anything like is there any take-home message you like people to uh, go home with? Well, and, sure. Uh, you know, my take-home message is the same one I've said before. <laughs> you know, here's another way of saying it: hmm. If you think of yourself as a futurist. You should think of yourself as somebody who thinks on longer timescales, on, on what's going on not tomorrow or next week or even next year, but in 10 years or 20 or 100. If you're a person like that, you should not be really focused on every little press release or little news thing that comes up. That's the wrong timescale to be focused on. You should look at long-term trends, read studies about long-term trends, and think about how those project forward into long-term trends. Think about the long run. Don't get so caught up in every little news article because hmm. that's just not very informative about long-term trends. Hmm. Those those news articles are very tantalizing and interesting and, and lovely and you get plenty of Facebook <laughs> posts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a siren song, I'd say. Beware the siren song. <laughs> yes. <laughs> great. All right. It's been wonderful uh, interviewing you yet again. It's been a great chat. Um, so signing out. Uh, cheers, Robin. Take care. Bye.